Good morning, COD. Will you stand with us? Let's worship our Lord this morning. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me there's nothing to fear now for i am safe with you so when i fight i'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high oh
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
right, you may be seated. So today we're going to take some time in our service to celebrate communion together. And so today as we celebrate communion, it's good for us to stop and even think about what is the purpose of communion. So 2,000 years ago, there's Jesus. He's sitting with his disciples in the upper room, and he was getting ready to go die on the cross for not just the sins of those disciples there in the room, but for everyone that followed and claimed the name of Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for your sin. So all the things that you do say, think that displease God, well, the Holy Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, died to take all that sin upon himself that you might be forgiven and have a new life. And so there he is in the upper room getting ready He knew what was about to come, getting ready and preparing the disciples for what life was like afterwards. So you think about it, these disciples spent at least three and a half years with him. They were hanging out with the most wonderful person who ever lived. Nobody knew them better than this man, Jesus. And he was preparing them. He said, listen, there were some elements there around the dinner table and He took the bread and he said, this bread is a symbol of my body, which will be broken for you. And then he took, after the dinner, he took uh, the cup and the cup had wine. And he said, this wine symbolized my blood that's about to be shed for you for the ransom of many. That many may be set free through my blood, through my sacrifice. And he said, I want you to continue to do this when you gather to remember me and then proclaim the message that we're talking about right now and the message that you're about to see and witness and proclaim this message until I return or until I take you home. Well, the disciples didn't just keep that communion or that last supper to themselves, did they, church? And so they proclaimed it to the Christ followers there. And so for 2,000 years, those who claim the name of Jesus, those who identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of the, the Lamb of God for the sins of the world have taken communion. Jesus is very intentional, isn't he? He established that communion for us to let us know that, listen, we are in communion with him. We're united in Christ because of his death, burial, and resurrection and our belief in that, our faith in that. And then we're also united or in communion with those who also claim that same message. Other Christ followers like those sitting around you today. When we receive communion, it is a time to remember his sacrifice. Remember that we're not alone in the struggle. But it's also a time for us perhaps to evaluate our lives and how we're doing. The very thing we believe, how is our life lining up with our belief and our faith in Christ? How's our relationship with God? How is our communion, our relationship with those that God's placed in our life? And so if you would just for a moment, while you sit there, before we take the elements, because we're never supposed to rush into this, take a moment and reflect how you're doing in your walk with Jesus. Are there things that you need to confess right now and say, God, I'm giving this to you and help me to begin to work on this and bring people into my life and help me to confess this to other people so I can get some help? And then also think about how you're doing in relationship with those that God's placed in your life. So we want to give you a moment or two just with reflection here in the room or wherever you are joining us. Just to sit and think about, God, how am I doing? Ask him that question. We'll give you a few moments. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice for us. That while we were still sinners, while we were your enemy, that you died on the cross to take our sin debt upon yourself, that we might be free from the penalties of our sin and live the abundant or the overflowing life in you. Thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your goodness. We celebrate that right now. 
Amen. And so if you would just peel back the, the top film there, the transparent cover, and just hold the wafer in your hand. So this wafer symbolizes the body of Jesus. And I believe, as we think about this, it also symbolizes his goodness. He's a good God, right, church? Isn't he good? Psalm 100, verse 4 says this, that we are to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. If you bless the name of Jesus, you're thankful for his sacrifice for you on the cross, and you're committed to live for him with every breath you have in you. Take and eat. You can peel back the cover there to the juice. This juice symbolizes his blood spilled for us, shed for you that you might be forgiven. Some people call the communion cup the cup of thanksgiving. If you're thankful for Jesus, well, then maybe you identify with Psalm 100, verse 5, that says, For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. The Lord is good. His steadfast love endures how long? Forever. And this juice symbolizes the forgiveness of your sins. If you're thankful for the goodness of God, and if you want to live your life in gratitude that you've been now been made free, take and drink. Jesus, we thank you. Our words cannot express how grateful we are for all that you are for us and all you do for us. You're so good. Now, Lord, just like you told the disciples, we want to say it now. Would you help us to remember and to proclaim your love through all generations until you return or you take us home? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand with us as we continue to worship. Will you stand with us?
Amen. Great worship. Thank you for joining us in that and just lifting your voices to Jesus. It's true that it should be well with our soul. He's so good. Hey, welcome to church. If we haven't met before, my name is Brett, and it's a joy to be with you today and worshiping our Savior Jesus. And our church, our heart's desire is to help people discover life change. So what we just celebrated through song, what we just celebrated through communion, we want everyone to celebrate every day. The miracle of life change. As a church, that's what we exist to preach and be about. So we're glad you're here with us. If you're newer, we'd love to get to know you. You can stop by our Next Steps area on the way out. Or you can just text welcome to 717-297-8900. And we'd love to get to know you better. So go ahead and do that. If you're newer here, uh, we would love to meet you. We're having something called Coffee with the Team. And that's coming up on October 2nd at 4 o'clock right here in our Common Grounds. And so you can text COFFEE if you'd like to join us for that. So if you've been here maybe just for a few weeks or maybe even a few months, but you want to get to know the staff and those that work behind the scenes as part of our West York team, that's a great time to do that answer. Uh, we can answer any questions you might have and talk about our church. Uh, we're looking forward to that. Parents, grandparents, we're having a child dedication class. We love child dedications here, don't we, church? And we love celebrating what God's doing in the life of a family as they seek to raise their kids to love Jesus and devote their life to him. And so we actually have a class for that coming up on the 9th. And then our dedication will happen in our services on the, the 22nd of October. So there you go, parents. You can sign up for that in the Planning Center app. Uh, maybe you notice on the way in we have um, a friend here from Habitat for Humanity. They're actually doing a build in Dover, and we wanted to let you know about that. Maybe you can be involved in helping us as we join with Habitat as they build a home um, right here in our neighborhood down the street. And something, uh, you have any uh, questions about that, please stop, ask them on the way out. And we, there's a women's build uh, on the 3rd, and then actually two days before that, there's a faith build. And uh, so we can all go and do that. So you can sign up there at the booth in the lobby or any questions you might have. Always a great opportunity for us to serve our neighbors in Jesus' name. Right, church? Men, we're going camping. We're going camping. Who likes to camp? Who likes to glamp? Glampers. I know I, I, have, I work with some glampers. Their idea of camping is like, yeah, the Hilton. Getting those Hilton points, huh, Pastor Bob? If you need to borrow a tent, Pastor Don actually has seven or eight that he's never used. They're still in the box. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, man, we're going camping, Father, Son, Pencho, coming up 14th, 15th, 16th. It's $10. Um, you can show up as early as 3 o'clock on that Friday. Come and go as you can based on your schedule, what's going on in your life. I'm looking forward to it. My boys are. And I know many of you guys that are going are looking forward to that as well. And so you can sign up for that. Um, on our app there. Um, women, we're having our first of many breakfasts coming up on October 1st. So ladies, hope you can go to that. It's always great. And we're going to be having um, a bunch in the next few months, the first Saturday of the month. So bring a friend, bring your kids, uh, uh, daughters. That would be great. Older daughters, wonderful time there. You can register in the Church Center app. Today as we pray, we're praying for Nathan and Laurel. So thankful for their desire to serve Jesus. God placed in their heart a desire to go to a people group that wasn't reached. And it ended up being a tribe. And so they're serving this tribe. They know the language. They love the people. They're starting a church. There's actually in this tribe um, people in that live in this tribe that are now the leaders in the church, the elders in the church and teaching. And we're so thankful for what God's doing. And we're praying for them as they seek to reach uh, others around them and other tribes, and God continue to raise up leaders and people get saved. We're actually going to have a luncheon in their honor over at our East Shore campus coming up on the 25th, and so we want to make sure you know about that. Get to know them. They're an amazing couple, great family, love their kids as well. We're able to serve them and, and have all the things that we do here in the county uh, right here in central Pennsylvania, thanks to your generosity. When we give, we're just giving back um, from what God's given to us, right, church? God loves generosity. He's a generous God who just gave you your last breath. And so that's just what he does. He gives. And so as his people, we give too. We give our time. We give our resources. We give our energy. And um, so we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to give. In this spot, um, this is kind of the offering spot, right, where we just give thanks just like we would when we pass the plate. We'd give thanks for the offering. Well, now we give thanks for the opportunity he's given us to give. And there's different ways you, you can give and you can see that. But we want to start with gratitude there. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Conrads. 
Thank you for this couple just serving you, this desire to just make you great among the nations. And you called them to go to this tribe out of their comfort zone to share the good news and be good news. And you're, done a, you're, you're doing a great work, and we're so thankful. Would you continue to encourage them, continue to rise up leaders uh, in the, um, of the tribe, and that they may be a tribe that reaches other tribes, that many may come to know you, Jesus, as their Lord, as their Savior of their life. Bless them. We look forward to being able to get to know them a little bit better or catch up with them um, pretty soon here. We're thankful for our partnership with them and their example to us. Thank you for the privilege you've given us to give. And you're so good to us. You've given us so much. So we thank you for the opportunity. We pray for your blessing and dedication on the funds that we've been able to give today and this week, Lord. May you use it to reach many, to give comfort to those who are hurting, to put a smile on our kids' face, uh, to help us share the message of the gospel with the teenager in need, and to be able to serve our local partners who do such great work. God, you're so good. So thank you for allowing us to do some good back. Now prepare our hearts as we hear your word through Pastor Don. Thank you for him and this message you've placed on his heart. And when we leave here, Lord, help us not to go through the motions, but may we be more like Jesus Christ, the one who wants to change our lives and made a promise to finish what he started. May you do that today as a result of our time here. And we pray this in the most beautiful name ever, the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Pastor Brad. I have camped once, and I, I went camping. I was looking for the concierge. I'm like, well, where's that? Where is he? So I was, I'm not doing that again. That was it. Last time we went camping. But anyway, hey, it's great to see you. Um, it's great to be here with you and those of you online as well. And of course, those of you in East York, I miss you. I'll be there, be back next week. I was gone last week as well, so it'll be good to catch up with with many of you. Good morning to you. Pastor Bob last week began as an introduction, uh, our study of the book of Romans, the letter of Romans that Paul wrote to them. And I have the privilege of getting us started here in chapter 1 this morning. And so if you'll turn there with me and your copy of God's Word, I want us to uh, just take a look at what uh, Paul says here at his opening. It's kind of a heartfelt hello that Paul gives as he, before he gets into some tough stuff. Uh, he gives a real heartfelt hello. And we do that when we write letters. We give the flowery stuff, you know, dear so-and-so, dear mom and dad. So great to have, uh, you know, to talk to you yesterday. I'm looking forward to coming home uh, to visit. You've been such a great guidance and a great, great mentors in my life. I respect you immensely. Um, by the way, could I have $100 for gas to come home? Right. That was, that was two years ago. Now it's $200. Can I have $200 for gas to come home? But some of us are better at writing the letters than others. You know, most of our letters are only seen by a few people. If you write a love letter, that's really for one set of eyes only, right? But then there are famous letters that are really world-known, world-renowned. The, the letters from Albert Einstein to Franklin Roosevelt that suggested that the atomic bomb was possible. It's a letter that people have read. There's letters from uh, the groans of the Britain letter, a letter by ancient Britons that have effectively populated the start of the English language. There's the letters that Abraham Lincoln wrote, five letters in particular, many of them public, that bolster the northern morale and help the Union win the Civil War. And then there's the letters of Paul. I would say the letters of Paul are probably the most read letters of all time. And have affected the world in a tremendous way and impacted Christianity more than what we can probably measure. It's difficult to imagine the letters of uh, Christianity without the letters of Paul. And the letter of, uh, that Paul wrote to the Romans is kind of his letter to le of letters, I think. It's the masterful theological letter sent to the Romans. And we're going to spend the next eight to nine months going through this together. It is going to be 
amazing. So don't miss it. It's going to be really great. It is so rich with so many things. You'll see that even here as we just begin the first couple of, ro- uh, couple of verses. But, but Paul writes this to a group of people he's never met. Most of the letters that Paul wrote were to churches that he established. He went out and he, he was evangelistic. He went on those missionary journeys. He started churches all over Asia Minor. And then he wrote letters back to them to encourage them and to give him more of his thoughts as he tried to encourage them in their faith. But Rome and the people in Rome never have met Paul. They've never seen him. They know about him, uh, but he has never visited there. And he wrote this in about 57 A.D., and he, we do know from the end of the, the book of Acts that he eventually gets there around 60 A.D. So he's writing this about three to five years before he gets to actually visit with them. And if you look at the end in Acts chapter 28, you'll see that he does actually end up getting to Rome eventually. And so that's kind of the setting of where we are. This letter is getting to them before he has had a chance to visit And so we're going to just take a look at what he said to them initially in this letter. But let's pray first. Father, we're going to thank you for uh, your word again this morning, the opportunity to look at it, the opportunity to to teach from it. And I pray that you would uh, guide our hearts and our minds uh, that anything we say uh, from a human standpoint would fall away, but that your word will, will remain true as it will be forever and will teach us this morning in Christ's name. Amen. We start with Paul's hello, his salutation, verse 1. Paul says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Verse 1, Paul says, I was called to be apostle. Remember the dramatic conversion of Saul when he became Paul in Acts chapter 9. And in verse 15 it says this, the Lord said, the man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of of Israel. So Paul was set apart. This was his passion. When he got saved, it was dramatic. And he made a 180 degree turnaround. And instead of persecuting the Christians and, and, and looking at, he was now proclaiming, proclaiming this idea of following Jesus. He says, I have called and set apart for the gospel. Number verse 2, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. If you go to Ephesians chapter 1, you'll find that Ephesians, Paul is writing to to them, and he's reminding them as well that this has always been the plan. This gospel I'm talking about has always been the plan. He says in verse 4 of Ephesians 1, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us in all wisdom and understanding. And he has made known it to us, the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Jesus Christ. It's been the plan all along, this idea of the gospel that's wrapped around, he'll tell us in verses 3 and 4, that is totally wrapped around this person of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 3. Regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God. By his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul tells us right at the beginning here that this gospel that he's talking about, that he wants to proclaim to those that he's writing to, revolves around Jesus who is uniquely qualified to be the object of our faith. In Bible college classrooms, they call it the hypostatic union. Anybody heard that before? Some of you had, I'm sure. Right. Those of you who went to Bible college especially. Good. You were listening. The hypostatic union, it's it's a word that comes from the Greek word hypostasis, and it is the most memorable place found in Hebrews 1 where it says Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Now, how many of you used to watch The Credible Hawk, David or Bruce Banner turning into the, the big green monster, David Hawk, right? That is not what we're talking about, okay? So get that out of your mind. I'm sorry I put that even in your head. Get that out of your mind. But we like object lessons around here. So I have an object lesson here for you. All right, I have up here some Turkey Hill iced tea. And it is made in the Conestoga Valley down across the river, down the road a ways. 
This is where they make comes from a totally different place than Rudder's Lemonade, which is made in York County, right? And so I'm going to take this iced tea and everything that's in it that makes up this iced tea, I'm going to pour it into this glass. Don't try this at home. It's the closest thing I'll ever do to a magic trick right there. And that's, that's still, it's still iced tea. We think of Jesus sometime as this illustration right here. God came into this world and he entered into the human body and lived his life and did his thing and then died on the cross for us. But in fact, it was much more than that because this lemonade, I'm going to now mix in here with this iced tea and I hope it doesn't overflow. Well, that was close. I've created a whole new thing that we call, what do we call this? What? Oh, don't spill it. Yes, good. Yes. All right. Got it. It tastes good, though, buddy. It tastes good. If you want to sip, feel free. It's the Arnold Palmer. It's a totally new thing, right? It is no longer just iced tea. It is no longer just lemonade. We've combined it into something that is organically totally different. I can't take these and separate them. I can't come over here and take the iced tea and pour it back into the iced tea bottle and the lemonade and pour it back in the lemonade bottle. It will never happen again. It's inseparable. That is an illustration of the unity of Christ's humanity and divinity in one existence. The lemonade and the iced tea create the Arnold Palmer. The humanity and the divine nature of God create who we know as Jesus. Because of the incarnation, Jesus, before the incarnation, Jesus existed not as Jesus. He was the second person of the Trinity. We know it was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They were spirit. God is spirit. And at the incarnation, his title was changed. He was a distinct personal being that was created in the womb of Mary. And Joseph and Mary were told by the angel, and you will now call him Jesus. Totally different than prior to the incarnation. Prior to that, no one like Jesus has ever existed. And we know from our study of the word that, that the sin nature of man is passed on from one generation to another through the seed of Adam. 1 Corinthians 15 says, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. It does not say as in Eve all die, because it's not through the woman. It is through the man and the seed of the man that the sin nature is passed on. And that is why the virgin birth is so important. It's so critical to the foundation of our faith and who Jesus is. Because if Jesus was born of the seed of man, if Joseph was his biological father, he would be no different than you and me. It would have a sin nature and would be able to sin and would sin. But he was born of a virgin. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, Mary, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. In his incarnation, he was born with two complete natures. One fully human, like the lemonade. One fully God, like the iced tea. Or vice versa, depending on what you like more. Two complete natures in one person, the God-man. He was not two people. He was one person. And the hypostatic union, that term, is the joining of the divine and the human in one person, Jesus Christ. This is huge for a number of reasons. And it is this. Paul is going to argue throughout his letter to the Romans that we are all doomed in our sin. That's going to be the first thing we talk about starting next week. We are a mess. And Jesus is the only one, he will tell us, and the only way to remedy that problem. He's the only one that can offer salvation from the sin nature that we inherited from Adam through our fathers. And that's why it's so important for our eternity. The virgin birth and who Jesus was in his nature is so important. It's also hugely important for today. Because you see, he not only knows your needs, he experienced your needs. His human nature not only hears of your pain, he experienced your pain. He not only understood that the justice of God needed to be administered on humanity's sin, and so he knew that as a human and human nature, he could become the object of wrath that God needed to pour out on all mankind. 
He also understood that his divine nature allowed him to be the perfect spotless lamb of God that could actually take away our sin and not just cover it up until next time. Those two entities that make up Jesus Christ, so important for our salvation. He can relate. He can understand. He can feel. He can empathize. He can sympathize. He was touched with our humanity because he was fully man. He gets you. He gets you. He gets me. He understands us. And so he intercedes on our behalf with full knowledge. He sits at the right hand of God with full knowledge of what it's like to live in a fallen world. With full knowledge of what it's like to walk in your shoes. He gets you. He understands. Next Tuesday will be four months since Don and I had to bury our oldest son, 25-year-old Graham Hunt. We're still beginning our journey of that grief, and I want to take this time because it's the first time I've been in front of you since then. I want to acknowledge um, your care for us, your love for us, uh, your gifts, your cards have been unbelievable, and have really helped sustain us. They've sustained us, so thank you. Thank you. It's a journey I wouldn't wish on anyone, and it's one that we don't even completely understand, like what's next, right? But God does, because he gets us. And so we can go to him and get that help when we have need. The grief is so great, but God's grace is even greater. And we're keeping our circles Kind of small at this time, as you can understand. But you know who I don't even have to explain it to? Many of you come up, how are you doing? How's Donna doing? And I so appreciate that. I'll try to give you an answer, but oftentimes I don't have any. I don't, I don't know how we're doing. But you know who doesn't even ask the question? Another parent who's lost their child. Right? They get it. They understand. And sometimes we feel like, how can I know God? He's God. I mean, he's so big. He's so massive. He's he's, he's distant and aloof, but he's not. He's not. We serve a personal God who loves you, wants a relationship with you, and he gets you 100% in all that you're experiencing and going through. And he can relate to you and provide help in time of need. Hebrews chapter 14 says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. How can Jesus help us if he doesn't get it? Well, in fact, he does. So he can help because of this union of the human and the divine. That's why the gospel and the good news revolves around Jesus. Paul's going to lay that out for us over the next eight months. Wow, that was just verses 3 and 4. Paul has so much to say. It's so great. Verse 5, he says, Through him and for his name's sake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. Paul was called to take the gospel to the Gentile word as well. Aren't you glad that he did? Most of us sitting here this morning are Gentiles. And so praise God that we are in on the blessing of the salvation of God. Well, let's look at verses 18 to 13 and see three things that Paul says after he gives those little flowery comments. He says three things. Number one, he says, I am eager. He'll say that I am obligated. And he'll say, I am not ashamed. And so let's take a brief look at them this this morning. Verse 8, Paul says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. Whoa, stop right there. Your faith is being reported all over the world. Paul says, I've never met you. I've never seen you. I don't have an email to email you. I haven't seen videos of you on YouTube or Instagram. I don't know. I've never met you, but you know what? I heard all about you. Your faith is known all over the world. That's incredible. Paul was probably 650 miles from them. That's like from here to like northern New Hampshire. And he knew all about their faith. How about you? How about me? Is our faith known on our street? Are we known to be a believer in our workplace or in our, or in our neighborhoods? And there are a lot of churches that are known for a lot of things. They're not all good. And you hear that chatter, right? That church, oh, that church over there, they, they, you know, chew up and spit out their pastor every two years. 
That church there, they make their ladies wear pants at that church. That's what they're known for. That church, they only do is ask for money, whatever it is, right? Those aren't good things to be known for. What about COD? What are we known for? What are we famous for? Is our faith, is our ministry, is our obedience to what we've heard through Jesus Christ, is that heard about in Carlisle and Lancaster and Gettysburg? How far-reaching is the good chatter about Church of the Open Door? The church in Rome was known for the right things. Paul says, I've heard about you. You're known all over the known world because of your faith, and it should be a way with us as well. He goes on in verse 9, says, God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, they may be open for me, to, there may be a way for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, you and I might mutually be encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you but have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you so as to just as I have among the other Gentiles. In those four verses, Paul says, number one, he says, I constantly remember you in my prayers, verse 9. Verse 10, finally, finally, says, God, looks like God's opening a way for me, verse 10. Verse 11, I long to see you. In verse 13, by the way, just so you know, I tried many, many times to come to you. You need to understand that. Can you, can you get the picture here? Do you hear the heart of what Paul is saying, his, the heart of his message, the eagerness that he has to be with them and to fellowship with them? Have you ever wanted something so badly and it just keeps eluding you? Has that ever happened? You can almost, you know, I just, right now I could use a big chocolate shake from Dairy Queen. Right? Amen. Heard that in the front there. And it's just, it's eluding me. I can't, I, I just, I want it now. And it's, I can't, I can't afford it. Or I, I don't have time to stop by or whatever the reason. It's eludes you. you. You know what that feels like? You want it so bad you can almost will it to be. That's how Paul felt about these people. That was his heart. He just, he could not wait. It was driving him crazy that he didn't have the opportunity to get to these people yet. He wanted to so badly. Paul says, I am eager. And it's a challenge to me about my own eagerness in my own heart. What am I eager about? I'm eager about getting to lunch today. Is that what you're thinking? I'm sitting there. I'm kind of eager about going on vacation next week. That's all I can think about. I'm kind of going through the motions here this morning. I'm just thinking about what i got to pack. Right? And oftentimes we think about it, our eagerness is directed towards the temporary. It's always directed towards the temporary. Second Timothy, Timothy tells us, now there's a store up for me, he said, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all those who have longed for his appearing. Do you long for the eternal? Are you eager for Christ to return for his church? You know, it's interesting how eagerness grows for the eternal as you grow older and experience some life. All of us can remember back when we were, you know, seniors in high school. We were just eager to get to graduation. And then we're eager to get our first job or go off to college, have that career. We're eager to buy our first house. We're eager to find that person that God has for us. We're eager to get married. We're eager to have children. All those things come. They're all part of our life. But as you experience life, especially the tough stuff along the way, you begin to long for his appearing. You begin to understand that this life has really very little to offer. And we long for the things that are eternal. Well, Paul mentions two areas of eagerness. I want to just talk about quickly. He First thing he says, he was eager to love. He couches it in the idea of them being mutually encouraged by one another. But in Romans chapter 12, he'll say later more about it. And he'll say this in verse 9 of 12. Love us, be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Man, if we could just get people to start living their lives that way, what a difference it would make. What a difference it would make in this world. We so often speak before we think. 
we make judgments on people and situations before we have all the information and, and the answers to even make a kind of judgment. We're sure with our kids and our, our spouses. We're eager to feel comfortable. We're eager to, to get our way. We're eager to be selfish so often. But Paul says, I want to encourage you to be eager to love Mr. Rogers said it as only Mr. Rogers could say. He said that there are three ways to ultimate success. The first way is to be kind. The second way is to be kind. And the third way is to be kind. What the difference it would be if we would just love as he loved us. Let's start that here at CD. Make that sure that's part of who you are. That, could that be heard about around York County? It's about CUD. They love. Can, you, can that be heard about? Far reaching beyond these walls? I hope so. Be known all over the world. The second thing Paul was eager about was to pray for them. He had been praying for them and he shows his eagerness. He's like, I constantly, I remember you. Constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. Kind of like, it was redundant. It says that a couple times in that short phrase, right? Paul loved these people and in loving them, I think, he loved them so much, and the reason I think that he did is because he prayed for them so much. He loved them so much because he prayed for them so much. Do you know that it's very hard to be angry with people when you pray for them? You angry with somebody? You got a bone to pick? Stop sitting around thinking about it and getting yourself all worked up, which you do, because I do. And then all of a sudden that little bone that I'm supposed to pick becomes a huge skeleton of things. Right? It grows over time. Stop. Just pray for that person. It doesn't matter if you're wrong, they're right, they're wrong, you're right. It doesn't matter. Just pray for them. Pray that God make amends on that. It's very hard to be jealous of people when you pray for them. It's very hard to be, to not love people when you spend time praying for those people. You have p p difficult people in your life, pray for them. You have people who have hurt you, pray for them. You say, God, I don't, I don't have a heart for the world. I don't know people in the, around the world. I've never been around the world. Never been out of the country. Never been out of York. You know, so I don't, I don't know. They want us to pray for these, these people group in Africa. That, so I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't know what to say. Listen, God, how God's going to give you a heart for them is if you pray for them. Just pray for them. And God will work in your heart. And all of a sudden, you love these people you never met because you prayed for them. And I think that's what was happening to Paul. You'll be amazed how God turns your heart that is hardened to them and soften it as you begin to love again. And if you don't do that, it's just shame on you and hard on you. They're not affected by it. If you're mad at me, I don't care. I mean, I do care, but you know what I'm saying? You're, you're sitting around mad. You're bitter. You're worried about it. I'm going on with my life. So do business with the Lord in that way. Pray for them. Pray for people and be eager to pray for them. And God, I think, will help you love them and you will be eager to love them. So here's your homework for this week. Monday through Friday, I'm going to do five days. Monday through Friday this week, I challenge all of us at the church to set it on your phone, set the alarm for 110, Romans 110, where he says, I'm constantly thinking and praying for you. Romans 110, so 110 every day. And you can decide if you're going to do that a.m. and p.m. That's up to you. But at least one time over the 24-hour period at 110, let the alarm go off and just pause and pray. Pray for somebody that's, that, that you're struggling with. Pray for somebody who maybe it hurt you. Pray for somebody who has a real need that, that in your life. Pray for uh, uh, the, the leadership of COD. Pray for this church. Pray for us as we go through Romans that everyone who comes and sits under the teaching of the word will be affected and grown. The spirit will do a work over the next eight to nine months. Pray for that. 110 every day, Monday through Friday. That would be a great thing for us to do. And you'll know when that alarm goes off, hey, there's about 600, maybe 800 alarms maybe going off around York County right now. We're all praying. And that's pretty cool. So do that. Paul was eager. Why was he eager? Well, verse 14, he says, I am a debtor or I am obligated. I am obligated, he said, verse 14, both to the Greeks and the non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. This is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome. Paul says, this gospel changed my life. I'm a debtor. I am eager and I'm obligated to teach this gospel. It was his duty to proclaim it anywhere and everywhere God gave him opportunity. And he says right here in this verse for us that the gospel does not discriminate. It's for the Greeks and the non-Greeks. It's for the rich and the poor. It's for the weak and the strong. 
He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he writes this. Just a couple years before this book, he writes this in 1 Corinthians to the Corinthian church. He says, though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to, a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jew, I became a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, I became like someone like that so that I could win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like someone who didn't have the law. Though I am free from God's law, I'm still under the law of Christ. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. And this was profound because Paul came from a situation, he came from a family. His heritage was Jewish. The Jewish people were the special chosen people. They were the ones given the Holy Scriptures. They were the ones who, who were the apple of God's eye. They were his people. And now Paul, who came and grew up in that lineage and that understanding, is now saying, wait a second, it's not just for my people. It's for everybody. It's for everybody. Even those who would be the enemies of of the nation of Israel. Even those who, who would, who would want to fight and kill all of us, it was for them. It's for them. It's for everyone. If we are carriers of the gospel, we can't pick and choose who it goes to. You know, do you have certain demographics that you avoid in your life? Certain places in your county that you, you, won't, you just won't go there? Do you avoid the, the lesser financial situation around you? Do you only shine in the, your part of the neighborhood, but you, you're not really interested in going across the tracks? Do we befriend those who look like us, think like us, dress like us, live like us, vote like us? If that's how we are disseminating the gospel, then shame on us. Paul gives us a clear example to go anywhere and everywhere to share the gospel to all who will listen. Paul says, I'll stand up before the Greeks, philosophers, and I'll work my way through it. God, give me the words because they're really smart. And I'll go to the beggar on the street and I'll tell him about Jesus too because it's for everybody. Everybody needs the message. Not only was Paul a debtor, but we're debtors. We owe everything to Jesus Christ as we consider all that he did for our freedom. Paul says, I'm obligated. The third thing that Paul says to us here, the first opening verses, he says, I'm not ashamed. Verses 16 and 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then the Gentile. For if the gospel of righteousness from God is revealed in it, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the just will live by faith. Probably two of the most famous verses in all of Scripture, maybe the most memorized as well, beyond maybe John 3.16 or something like that. But it's, it's the ones that resonated in the heart of Martin Luther, and it sparked the Reformation. Changed the world, these few verses, especially the just living by faith. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God Unto salvation. We talks about being ashamed. We'll find out what he's not ashamed and why in just a minute. But the word ashamed comes from two words that are put together, only intensifying the, the root word. And it really has the idea of being not humiliated. He's not embarrassed. Paul's like, I'm not embarrassed or humiliated by the gospel. Paul lived that out. He was boldly proclaiming it wherever he could. <clears throat> he was in no way humiliated or embarrassed by it. What about us, though? Are we unashamed in our proclamation of the gospel? I don't think so much it's that we are ashamed or that we are embarrassed. Certainly nothing to be embarrassed about, but I think we're often afraid. We're afraid we don't have all the answers. What if they ask me a question I can't answer, so I just won't say anything? I'm afraid of rejection. I'm afraid of, of relationship fractures around the Thanksgiving table. I'm not bringing up that subject because of what it might do to our relationship. We're afraid we'll mess up our presentation. We'll get tongue-tied and get all confused. We're afraid our, our life might negate our message. We're afraid people think we're weird in this post-Christian culture we live in. But the Bible says we do not have a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. And let's be bold in our witness like Paul was, not be ashamed or afraid of the gospel.
And he wasn't ashamed, he wasn't afraid, and he wasn't embarrassed because he knew of its benefits. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of God. It's the power of God. The word power comes from the, from the word where we get the word dynamite. And there's a lot of power in dynamite. But here he's talking about the power, the dunamis of God, not the power of man. And that's good news that I can't save myself. I'm sucked into the current of depravity because of Adam and the way he's passed that sin down onto all of us. I'm reaching out and I cry out, somebody help me. And God says, I will help you. I have the power to do that. The good news is that Jesus did what we could never do. If you just reach out your hand, he will deliver you out of the miry pit and set you on a solid rock. He'll put a new song in your heart. That is the power of the gospel. The gospel unleashes our ability to overcome through the Holy Spirit's work in our life. In Romans 8, Paul says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and through the gospel. So if you're here this morning and you're battling anxiety and you're trying to beat anxiety, the gospel has the power to do that in your life. It's the power of God. You don't want to defeat sin that's chasing after you. The gospel will be the power behind that victory. If you're struggling with alcohol or drugs, your greatest resource is the gospel. Listen, there are great programs out there, AA, NA, other kinds of programs. They're wonderful resources. They give you opportunity for community, but they can only take you so far in your recovery. They can only take you so far. The power to be totally free is in the gospel. It's the power of God to salvation. So with Jesus, you are not just redeemed, but you are fully recovered. And I understand what we say when we say we're in recovery. I understand. But in Jesus, you're recovered. It's a done deal. We just got to live like it. As you battle the need to know, you need to know that Jesus fought the fight at the cross. He fought that fight there. And he secured the power in his resurrection for you to fight your battle today. Paul says, I'm not ashamed because it is the power of God. Don't miss those words. Don't skim over them because they're so familiar. It's the power of God, and it is the power of God, he says, to save. It's the power of God to save. It's not the power to rejuvenate you. It's not a power to rehabilitate you. It's not a power to retool you. It is a power that's going to save you. If you were in a stream and you were caught in the current being sucked under and you were reaching out for somebody to rescue you, somebody to free you, somebody to deliver you, this is the word you want right here, this word for salvation. You don't need to be rehabilitated at that moment. You don't need to be re-educated at that moment. You don't need to be re-equipped at that moment. What you need is to be saved plain and simple. You need somebody to grab your hand and pull you out. And that's what he's talking about right there. It means to rescue, to deliver, to set you free. Paul wasn't ashamed. Why would he be? Because it's the power. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Finally, in verse 17, he says, For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. We understand righteousness because of the gospel. If we didn't have the gospel, we would not understand the gravity of our unrighteousness. But because of the gospel, we understand what righteousness is. Righteousness in the gospel is what we embrace by faith alone in Christ alone. I will never make myself righteous on my own. It's only by faith in Christ alone that I stand complete. What that means is that the righteousness that we're talking about here is not only starts with Christ, but it continues with Christ, it ends with Christ, it is all about faith in him. And if we learn to trust in him and bow before him, the righteousness of God can be revealed in our lives. And so just real briefly, because I'm way over time, I just want you to understand, if you do not know this person, Jesus Christ, if you know think that there was this body and God came and lived in it somehow, and that's kind of like a sci-fi movie, so I don't know what to think about any of that. That's not what it was. It was two entities. Through Mary, Jesus was born as a virgin birth. 
He had a human nature, 100% and 100% God, that were joined together. And he's able to do for you what no one else will or ever will or ever could do for you. It's the only way. It's the only way. And I encourage you to embrace him today. Paul says, I'm eager. I'm eager to see you. I'm eager to pray for you. I'm eager to love you. I'm eager to give the gospel because I'm obligated. What Christ has done for me and what he's chosen me to do, and I'm not ashamed to do it. And I hope that is your prayer as well today. Paul was not afraid either of sharing the hard news to help us see the beauty of the good news. That's coming next week. That's coming next week. You say, what in the world is this world coming to? What, what is going on in this world? It seems like it is falling apart everywhere I turn. Well, Paul will tell us next week what's going on. He's going to tell us. When left to our own hearts, denial of God's truth, we're going to get what we're going to find in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to chapter 3. That's what we get. And that's what the world's coming to. It's not very hard to explain or hard to understand. And we'll start looking at that next week. Pastor Bob will unpack that for us. I really hope you make an effort to, to be here for all of these. Romans is a long book. Yeah, we're going to be in it for a while. Don't miss. Don't miss out because it's so rich. It's so strong. So great. It's going to strengthen you. It's going to encourage you. It's going to challenge you. And I really pray that you make it a priority to, to be with us as we study through this book together. Thanks so much for being here today. Let's pray together. Father, what a great truth it is to hear just even at the opening part of Paul's letter to the Romans. So much is there already about who you are and what you've done. And I pray, Lord, today that as we reflect on Jesus Christ, that maybe we think of him even a little differently, Father. That incarnation was unique. It was special. It was, it was only at that moment that things changed. And God the Son became united with human, humanity and became Jesus, who now forever lives in a glorified body, making intercession for us. Father, that should encourage us, remind us we're not alone. And Father, thank you for the glorious gospel of his grace that has been shed abroad in our hearts. Father, take us from this place and bring us back together again soon in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful day. Great to see you.